أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين Firstly we send our condolences on the commemoration of the martyrdom of Imam al-Askari to the Imam of our time, Imam al-Hujjaj al-Farj al-Sharif and all of our ulama and the believers around the world that on this day we commemorate the martyrdom of the father of our holy Imam one of the youngest Imams who only lived for 28 years of those 28 years he was the Imam for six and during the period of his imama, he was placed under such harsh pressure that he would tell his companions, even if you see me in the street, do not send salam upon me. Do not even say salam to me. And in fact, the majority of the time that he would meet with his companions, he would meet with them behind a veil. So if someone was to walk past, they wouldn't know who they were speaking to. That this was the amount of difficulty that the believers and the Shia were living under at his time. There's a saying of the Imam, he says, خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ مَا إِذَا فَقَدَّهُ أَبْغَضْتَ الْحَيَاةِ He says, better than life is something. If you lose it, you begin to hate life. And he says, وَشَرٌ مِّنَ الْمَوْتِ مَا إِذَا نَزَلَ, ما إذا نزل بك he says, and worse than death is something that if it befalls you, you will begin to love death. It's a very important saying of the Imam. Something that's attributed to him speaks volumes about the time and speaks volumes about the condition of our lives to this day. That so better than life is something that if you lose it, you will begin to hate life. What is this thing? All these things that are better than life itself, many of them. That if you lose them, you begin to hate life itself. Some people, for their whole life, they campaign to have the ability to end their life. Why? Because they believe their quality of life has diminished. For example, if they have some sort of debilitating disease, such as many that we could name, MS, uh, heavy stages of, of cancer for example may it be far from you heavy stages of Alzheimer's heavy stages of uh, some sort of dystrophy muscular dystrophy that breaks your body apart piece by piece they wish that they could leave this life or some people for example that lose a loved ones is it not the saying of Imam Hussain السلام, ala, ala about his son Ali al Akbar he says that the, the greatest thing in this world has been taken off me. So after you, this world is worth nothing. Some people lose a loved one. Some people lose a position. Some people are humiliated. And they feel that by losing this thing, they begin to hate life. So there is a thing, in other words, that's greater than life itself. Not one thing, but many things. And then on the other scale, he says that there is something that is more evil than death, that if it befalls you, you would love death. Many of the times, there's a lot of things that are worse than death itself. People always try and run from death itself, yet there are things that are worse. Again, similar to the first thing, a degree of humiliation. Losing something that allows your life to be peaceful, to have a life that is happy. Usually around this time of year, companies like Google and other companies, they release lists, the best of 2014, the best movies of 2014, the best places of 2014, the best everything of the year because it's the end of the year. Amongst these lists are the places where they are the best or people have the best quality of life and usually they speak of the Scandinavian nations Norway and Sweden and Denmark and and these nations they usually say that these are the best nations to live in in the world because of the quality of life 
And yet we also see of these nations, they have the highest rates of youth suicide, Australia included. And they have the highest consumption of antidepressants, the highest consumptions of, uh, of these types of medication. So what is wrong if what we see on the outside they have all of these things? They have everything, all of the modern technology. They have all of the best things. They were saying, the, there was a, a report the other day, I think about Sweden. We, this is a country that's about to become the first cashless society. So everything's become digital. It's got to the stage where you can walk into a restaurant and you order your food. You, in fact, you order it on your telephone or on your tablet. And then when you finish, as you walk out, automatically the funds get deducted from your bank account. You don't even have to ask for the waiter to, to bring the bill. You walk out, it's deducted, and that's it, you keep walking. That they have all of this advancement and all of these things, yet why so much depression? So there's something, there's a core factor that's missing in their life. There's a core factor, forget about the health and the wealth. There's something else that's so important that they've forgotten in their life, that they've lost. And this is why you see youth suicide and you see a high amount of depression because of this. And yet you go to, to other places where they've lost everything and yet people can smile and still be happy. An example that comes uh, fresh off the top of our heads are for the brothers and sisters that had the ability to go and visit Imam al-Hussain in the Arba'een. The majority of the people that are there that want to serve the visitors of Imam al-Hussain are people that are living in poverty, are people that don't know what 24-hour electricity is, are people that save up their year's wealth to be able to buy a camel or a cow and slaughter it and feed the visitors of Imam al-Hussain and they do it with a smile on their face and they're happy. Yet they're in a country that's war-ridden, that's disease-ridden, that lacks many of the technologies but they have something that the others do not. It's a story of Nabi Isa alayhi salam when he is walking in a valley and he hears a call from within a mountain. Somebody is saying something. So he follows where the voice is coming from towards a mountain. He walks towards a mountain he sees a cave. And within this cave he hears a voice. A person is saying something. As he gets closer he hears him say, Alhamdulillah alladhi afan amma abtala ghayri wa law sha'a lafa'al. He says, Oh Allah, praise be to you that you have not allowed to befall me what has befallen other than me. And even if you had wanted to, you would have. This is mustahab that if you see somebody that's ill in it, with any illness, to say this dhikr three times. Alhamdulillah, alladhi afani amma abtalahum, walau sha'ala fa'ala. And if he wanted to, he would have. So you say, praise be to Allah. That I, for example, if you see somebody that is blind or somebody that's crippled, and you say this three times, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep this illness away from you. So he hears it over and over again. So Nabi Isa alayhi salam enters the cave and within this cave he sees a crippled blind man laying on the floor and yet he can still speak and he's saying Alhamdulillah alladhi afani amma abtala ghayri wa sha'a la fa'ala So the Prophet says to him that basically you've, you've got everything, you're, you're crippled and you're blind and you're in the middle of nowhere in the cave What makes you say this? He says I praise Allah that he has not made me forget thanking him but there's people out there that they've forgotten to thank him. They don't thank him. But me, I don't have this issue. He says, so praise be to Allah. Alhamdulillah. That I don't have this bala that I've forgotten to thank Allah. Yet yeah, others have forgotten to thank Allah. SubhanAllah, look at this. He, he's in a situation that would make you think that he fits that beginning hadith that says there is something that will make you hate life and there is something that will make you love death. Something if you lose it, it will make you hate life. And something if it befalls you, it will make you love death. This man would fit that equation perfectly and yet this man he says no. I praise Allah that he hasn't made me of the forgetful of the ones that do not thank him. This is the lesson that we, that we take from the Imams and from the Prophets especially in the times that we live now. With these lavish lifestyles that we have and we can't handle the smallest thing. I mean people make things up to complain about. You have to have something. It, it, SubhanAllah, in fact, it's almost like you can't tell somebody you're happy. If someone says, how are you? You have to say, oh, you know, I'm sick of work. I want to leave or something like that. You know, oh, I've just got a bill that just came in or I just copped a fine or I just whatever it is. That you can't just tell people, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy. Everything is good. 
Even if there is bala, every mu'min has to have bala. Every mu'min has to have trial. What's the point of your belief? If there is no trial, and you should be happy that if you have trial, and you can recognize it as trial. Some people have trial and they don't recognize it as trial. They just think, oh my God, God hates me. God hates me, I've got a blue car instead of a green car. God hates me because I have to wear the same shoes every day. For example. And they'll use this as an excuse and they don't even see it as trial. They don't accept it and say, Alhamdulillah, Allah is trying me and yet my belief is the same as it was. Our holy Imam was born 232 after Hijrah and he was martyred 260. At that time, at the Imam of our time, Ajla Farj al-Sharif, was five years old or six years old. The Imam used to live under such difficulty. Imam al-Askari salam, they used to put him into prison, out of prison, into prison, out of prison, and he spent much time in prison. One of the people that Al-Mutawakkil commanded that the Imam gets placed, the Khalifa at the time, to place the Imam in jail. So when he placed him in a jail, the person that was in charge of the jail picked two of the meanest people. He picked two of the meanest people in society, and he says, these two, I'm going to place them into the jail just to torment the Imam. Just to sit there and swear at him, and hit him, and torture him, and give him a hard time. That's it. So he grabbed two of them, and these people were known. You know how you have like, if I was to tell you, go to your community and pick two of the biggest troublemakers? You know what sorts of people they are, that they, these people are troublemakers anyway. Imagine they got paid to torment and torture someone, they'll love it. This is, this is what they do for free anyway. So basically he grabs two of the biggest, worst troublemakers, the, the ones that are always into fights, uh, and he, he gives them money and he places them in the jail with the imam. So a couple of days later he comes and asks about them and he's shocked. He says, where are these two mean guys that you picked? And he says, the two guys that you see praying at night and fasting all day, they're the two guys that you picked. And he says, what happened to them? So he called them over and he said, didn't we not pay you to torment the Imam? They said, when we came near him, the aura of the Imam made our legs tremble. And when we looked into his face, the aura of him, this is someone who carries the aura and the face and the light and the status of prophethood. This is the one who carries the inheritance of the Holy Prophet and you want us to torture and torment him, that when they saw him, immediately they changed. Many of the Imams have similar stories. However, with Imam al-Askari, this is a specific story. And in fact, with Imam al-Askari, there is a story of why he is known as Imam al-Askari. Other than the fact that the place where he is buried or where he lived most of his life, he was born in, in uh, al madinah al-Munawwara and yet he was forced to come with his father Imam al-Hadi to Samurra, or, or they call it Surra man Ra'a, and they've made it smaller and called it Samurra, which was a garrison town where the Imam remained there. Now they used to call him Al-Askari either because he lived in the garrison town, however, the traditions say they called him Al-Askari because of a, an incident that happened with the Khalif of the time. So, what the Khalif did is he got the Imam, for, he decided that one day he is going to show his power to the Imam. Like all tyrants, they always want to show their power. Why? Physically themselves, they have a deficiency. As human beings, we have a deficiency. We know that eventually there's a period where we are young and we are youthful and we have strength and we have ability, but this is going to go. It's always going to go. Remember we mentioned that hadith on Saturday night when the Holy Prophet says, uh, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعِزِّي that always with might there will come humiliation. Don't think the might remains forever. With might there is humility. You have the might of youth and then you have the humility of age. So this tyrant wants to show the Imam how great he is. He gets uh, 90,000 cavalry. This is 90,000 horsemen in full battle gear. And he gets them to line up in a certain area in formation. So he's showing a show of strength. Then he calls Imam al-Askari and he says to him, and the story is narrated with Imam al-Hadi as well, alayhi salam. He gets Imam al-Askari alayhi salam and he places him on the mountain and he says to the Imam, look at my army. And so the Imam looks at these 90,000 cavalry. Any person that would see that would be in fear immediately. That look at the size of this army. Even if we attempt an uprising, they will crush us. So the Imam says to him, would you like to see my army? 
And so the Khalif laughs. He says, all right, what's your army? So he says, look between my fingers. And I say, he puts up two fingers and he says, look between. And the Khalif sees through his fingers an army of angels that fills the whole sky and he loses color in his face and he faints. So the Imam stands and waits for him to wake up. They're all shocked. The Khalif wakes up and he says to him, I see your army and you saw my army. The issue isn't about the dunya. This dunya, we don't care, we don't want it. Our work is with the akhirah. Don't worry about us with the dunya. You think that the Ahlul Bayt are after the If we want the dunya, we will have it in less than a second. You saw our army. And the Khalif understood that this is somebody that he can't reckon with. This is somebody that he can't fight with. This is not somebody he can defeat. Because he sees the world as something, and the Khalif himself sees the world as something else. The Khalif sees it from a worldly perspective. That for him it's all about having that power and that ability to torment people. And this is what it becomes. Our Imams are all about the hereafter. And this is why the Imams have many miracles, especially Imam Al-Askari has many miracles with his companions. And I like to mention them as well as mentioning the akhlaq of the Imam. Obviously the, the Imam had the akhlaq of his forefathers. That he would only, for example, ride a mule or a donkey. Why? Because he would keep to being humble. That in fact, many a time of the miracles of Imam al-Askari specifically, and in fact the Christians of the era used to call him al-Masih, al-Masih al-Askari. This is what they used to call him. And they would ask him, why are you calling him al-Masih, the Christ? They said, because we see signs of him that have only been seen with the Christ. Signs of him that have only been seen with the Christ. Of the signs, one day... Somebody takes the Imam because they kept trying to kill the Imam in a secret way. After what happened to Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam and this eternal uh, uprising after the Imam. There's an eternal uprising in every person. Th imagine this, for example, when we look at, again, Ziyarat Al-Arba'in, and I don't want to bring Ziyarat Al-Arba'in into it. However, imagine that there is a, a place and time where over 20 million people gather in unison. To go to this one visitation, and yet this thing has no advertising. No one advertises for it. This thing was eliminated from the minds of the Iraqi people since the time of Saddam for 30 years. So in other words, there's people that were born in Iraq and raised in Iraq and have never seen the Arba'in walk. And they're my age maybe, a bit younger than me maybe. Imagine, they'd be in their 20s and they never understood even what it is. How did they know about it that the second the tyrant died, they all had the ability to come. And they would all be there. This is the uprising that Imam al Hussein started. So after this they said we can't kill the Imams in this manner. We have to kill the Imams in a subtle manner. Via poisoning or something like that. So for Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, one of the companions of the Khalif of the time took Imam al-Askari and he threw him amongst wild beasts. Lions or something like that, birds of animals of prey. So the Imam gets thrown in there and they wait a while and then they see that the animals begin to walk around the Imam and then the Imam stands up and he's in prayer. The animals will not even go near him or will not even attack him. So they realize that this is somebody that has some sort of a connection. This is one of the miracles of the Imam. Another one, there was a wild mule, but it was the Khalif's mule. And he wanted to ride this mule. Every time anyone would get on the mule, the mule would launch them off. And some of them would end up with fatal injuries. So he said, this is a great idea. I'll bring the imam and I'll tell him, can you ride this mule? And when he does, the mule will throw him off and kill him. And then that way I can clean my hands off the imam and I'll say, I didn't kill him. He rode the mule and he killed him. So he brings the mule. The imam comes to the mule, places a saddle on it, gets on the mule and rides the mule. So the khalif is shocked. He says, it's a gift to you. That this mule was something that would have been... One of the best mules obviously because it is uh, under the ownership of the Khalif and yet no one had the ability to ride it. These are of the, the miracles of the Imam. Another miracle is one of the companions of the Imam was sitting with him and the Imam was writing a dissertation. And as he was writing this article of work, it was time for prayers. He says, so I saw the Imam stand up to pray and yet the pen continued to write on its own. Until he finished the prayers, he came back and it was finished. So the Imams had this ability. They had these miracles under their hands, however, this is not what it was about. Life is not about this. Life is not about ownership 
Life is not about accumulating wealth. And in fact, you will see that no matter how much you have and how much you do, you will always have this blank and this void. The perfect examples are the philanthropists of our times. The philanthropists like Bill Gates, the philanthropists like Warren Buffett, who although they could give a huge amount of charity and cure the world of polio, however, they feel the need to make sure we all know about it. Because this fills that void. That they have so much, that they have this guilt and they need to fill this void. That this is not what it's about, not about accumulation of wealth. And so the Imam, salawatullahi alayhi, would show them that I have this in my hand and this ability, yet life is not about this. No. Life is about being concerned with the hereafter. That the goal isn't in this world. When the Imam was a child, Imam al-Askari, there's a story about him and some attribute it to uh, Bahlul being present in this story or it could have been just a random person. So the person is walking in the street and he sees children playing. And amongst the children is Imam al-Askari when he is a child, yet he is sitting on his own. So he comes up to him and he says to him, What's wrong with you, child? Why aren't you playing with the other children? Do you not have any toys? And the Imam says to him, No. He didn't know he was the Imam, he just saw him as a child of the, of the Hashemites, of the Alawites. So he says to him, Then will they not play with you? He says, No. And he says, Why do you not play? He says, Have we been created? for play and the man is shocked he says oh man have you not read in the holy quran when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تَرْجَعُونَ that do you think that you have been created for nothing and that you will never be returned unto us so he is shocked that this young child is speaking like this he says to him but you were but a child you were small he says yes i am small but i see when my mother prepares the furnace for cooking, she places the small twigs and the small twigs are what light up the bigger logs. So that fire can be uh, ignited and she can cook. He gives him that comparison. They say that Bahlul or the man at the time passes out when he hears this. That these words coming from such a young child, that even from that time, he's speaking about and he's showing what the true meaning of this life is is and trying to give understanding this is why the material things do not matter the material things do not matter that uh, narration of Nabi Isa alayhi salam when they ask Nabi Isa they tell him that we have seen that you walk on water that how can we have this ability to walk on water like you walk on water he says to them that to have this ability you must reach a stage where you see the gems as rocks Gems and rocks are the same thing. There's no difference between gems and no difference between rocks to you. This is it. Imam al-Askari salam one day he was riding with a companion and this companion narrates, he says that I was riding behind the Imam on a, on a horse and the Imam was in front of me. And he says, a thought came to my head that I have X amount of debts. You know, sometimes when you're traveling or when you're going and you start thinking about your debts and your bills and whatever there is. So he thinks, I have this debt, how shall I repay it? He says, I didn't say a word, but the Imam says, do not worry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pay. He says, then the Imam went really low on the saddle and he took out his staff and he hit the ground with the staff and he says to me, and it was night time, he says, get down off your horse and take what is on the floor. He says, I get down and on the floor is a gold bar. He says, I take the gold bar, he says, in my head I thought this will fulfill my debt, but where will I get the money to buy enough food for the winter? And then the Imam goes low on his saddle again and he strikes the floor with his staff. He says, get down and take what is off the floor and he finds a bar of silver. He laid under rates, he says, when I got back to my hometown, the weight in gold gave me the exact currency of my debt and not a penny more. And the weight of the silver gave me the exact amount for the food that I needed for the winter. This is who the Imam is. This is who the Imam is. They ask and he gives. Why he is the connection between the earth and the heavens. This is what the real Imam is. Not somebody that's chasing after power. The Imam is the one who can answer the questions of the people. The brother of the Imam, Ja'far, who is known as Ja'far al kadhab who is the brother of the Imam and claimed to be the Imam after Imam al-Asqid. Even though the Imam left a letter and he said to them, 
that the one who knows what is within this letter and, and knows the amount of wealth and knows the unknown, he will be the Imam. So when the Imam dies, he gets poisoned and he's martyred, his brother Jafar gets up to pray on the body of the Imam. So they tell him, hold on, before you get up to pray, are you the Imam afterwards? He says, most certainly I am. They say to him, then what is within this letter? And how much money is meant to come from so and so a place? So they say he, he pulls off his clothes like this. What's wrong with you people? Do you expect me to, to know the unknown? This is what he says to them. This is a person who claims to be the Imam and he's arguing, do you expect to know the unknown? And when he gets up to pray, a young boy, the age of five, comes and they say this boy has a, a, a bronzed face and has the look of prophethood. He says to him, oh uncle, move out of the way. This position is not for you. And so he moves out of the way and the Imam al-Hujjaj al sharif is that five-year-old boy that prays over the body of Imam al-Askari. That when there is a question or a doubt, the Imam has the answer and the reality and the solution. And you will see this in all of the Imams. That there was a time when there was a drought in Iraq next to Samarra. And there was no water, the, the, the sky it wasn't raining and the people were beginning to become afraid. So they needed the rain. They called towards the Muslims to go and pray. Nothing happened and then they saw a group of the Christians. So the Christians came up and they stood around and they raised their hands and they prayed to Allah and the clouds formed instantly and it began to pour down rain. So the people were shocked. The second they saw this, a lot of them started to lean towards Christianity. They would go and they would sit with the Christian priests and learn about Christianity. So the Khalif got scared. The Khalif doesn't care about Islam. But they, he knows his whole power base of Islam is the fact that he's a Muslim. This is what he basically they see, that he's a Muslim. And therefore he's the rightful Khalif. If, if it can be proven that he is not a Muslim, he will lose his status. So rather than him lose his status, he saw the people going away, he got scared. So he said to them, who shall I contact? He asked all the ulama, they had no idea. He said, we don't know what's, what's going on. These Christians have the ability that when they pray, it rains. So they call Imam al-Askari and they tell him, come and see. Answer this question for us. So the Imam says, tell them to come out. So the Christians come out and he says, tell them to pray for rain. They raised their hands and the clouds formed together and it began to rain. And they said, see? So the Imam says, the high priest of the Christians, tell him to give me what is in his hand. So they go up to the high priest and tell him, what is in your hand? He gives them something wrapped in a cloth. They remove the cloth and there is a bone. And the Imam, they tell the Imam, what is this? He says, this is a bone of one of the Anbiya. This is a bone of one of the prophets. They've taken it out of the grave. So they would raise their hands and say, oh Allah, by the bone of this prophet make it rain and he makes it rain. Of course, this is someone who is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The bone of a dead prophet, whose name we do not know. One of the prophets of Banu Israel. The bone of a prophet. So how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala react to the most beloved and greatest of his creations, Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma wow. salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And so he says, that after he's given this, the people obviously come back towards Islam and the Imam does the burial prayer on it and he buries the, the bone again because it's a bone of a prophet and he returns it to the place that it's supposed to be. This is who the Imams are. The whole purpose and point of the Imams is to keep us free from doubt. Is to keep us free from these distortions in religion, these distortions in faith that you see on a daily basis that are, are, are growing and misguiding people and pushing people of the path, off the path. One of the great sayings of the Imam, he says, لا يشغلك, لا يشغلك He says, do not be busied by wealth that is guaranteed. By leaving a deed that is obligatory upon you. That the money that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed towards you or appointed to you is something that is guaranteed. That you'll get it no matter what. Obviously there's two types of rizq. One that you seek and one that seeks you. However, the one that seeks you is yours regardless. 
That imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who brought you into this earth with nothing and then gave you all of this wealth. Do you think that he's going to leave you to starve? So the Imam says, do not make this thing that is guaranteed move you or trouble you away from or busy you away from the deeds that have been appointed as obligatory deeds upon you like your prayer. These are basically the words and the lessons of the Imam. That the most important thing for you is to grasp onto the hereafter and always remember the hereafter. Through this, you will get the best of this world and the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in the same way that He guides the righteous of His servants against their lower selves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure our sick and have mercy on our dead and to release the prisoners of conscience. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to repay our debts and to accept us of the righteous wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen rahmanullah wa ankara surat al-mubarak al-fatiha wa ahda thawabaha ila arwah al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat tasfiqa salat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad